Okay, hello everyone. Welcome back to our podcast. This is our first Q&A podcast. So um, our students sent in their questions after reviewing the first module or the first episode, which was the introduction to the science and art of psychology. So I guess we're going to dig in straight to the questions. And the first question is, um, on the topic of areas of specialization in psychology, can a person be both a psychiatrist and a psychologist? And in the context of the Philippines, what benefits would that have on a person choosing both? And what limitations or disadvantages will carry? Will that carry as well? Okay. All right. First, we have to talk about what the difference is. Um, mm-hmm. To be a psychiatrist, you have to have an MD. Okay. So for you have to have gone through med school mm-hmm. and then gone through all the hurdles you have to get through after med school which are, I'm not really very sure, but I know there's the internship and then there's the residency. I don't know if what comes first, is it the boards or the residency? And then after that, you have your specialization and specialization can take years as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's what you need to become a psychiatrist. Uh, It's really a, a very different path um and maybe just to um, clarify the practice of psychiatry is very heavily the um basically the understanding of uh, mental disorders in terms of um neurobiology Mm -hmm. because the practice of psychiatry is about psychopharmacology Mm -hmm. really the uh, what medicine you need to take it's it's more that than um, talk therapy, which is mostly, which is heavily what um, psychologists or counseling psychologists or clinical psychologists do. Uh, When it comes to talk therapy, there are many different um, approaches. In fact, I think maybe calling it talk therapy is quite, um, might be confusing because it's not just talk, right? There are techniques there are uh, exercises, practices um, um, that are done beyond just talk. Okay? It's just that, yes, psychiatrists have a different model. Okay? Their model of, of disorders is the medical model. And psychologists have a different model. And their model of disorders are, can actually be very, very varied as well. Okay? So... Um, you can be, there's nothing stopping anybody from being both a psychiatrist and a psychologist. But if you add up the number of years it would take for you to become a psychiatrist and then a psychologist, because to be a psychologist here in the Philippines, you have to have finished an MA in um, psychology and then taken taken the licensure. So it's kind of like, um, if you add all those up, it's a, lot a hefty number of yeah. years. Mm-hmm. That said, That is actually my dream. (laughs) During crazy moments where I am like, I look at my clients and I'm like, if I could just, you know, also uh, be the one to prescribe prescribe medicine and um, all that. Yeah. So that's my crazy dream. But uh, uh, in the absence of that reality, um, the importance of uh, psychiatrists and psychologists working together. Um, especially with clients who have really more clinical cases, uh, that's very important. And I I do work with psychiatrists um, closely with many of my clients. And what does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, That means that, well, how it usually happens for me is uh, my clients come to me and uh, we do a bit of assessment. And what I mean by that is... uh, not formal assessment, I don't give them any tests, but mm-hmm. just from um, maybe after two to three sessions, I give the recommendation. Mm-hmm. If there, there are certain flags that, you know, if it's there, I give the recommendation to seek out a psychiatrist immediately, even with just one session. But for some, I wait a bit and then I say, all right, I do recommend that you seek uh, help also from a psychiatrist. And these are the clients that, I know will benefit from taking medication. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, usually what happens is they go to a psychiatrist, 
Uh, they report to the psychiatrist what they reported to me. And usually the psychiatrist and I end up agreeing and then they get the meds that help them stabilize. And then they get, they get um, the whatever techniques to help them change their behavior to augment the, so they get st stable with the meds, okay? whether that's you know stability in their neurotransmitters or helps them uh, be less reactive and less anxious. And then what I work with uh, with my clients are the things that trigger those anxieties mm -hmm. and are the things that trigger those mood swings. Um, and so I work with them on processing that, whether processing it from the past because it's never been talked about, understanding it. I work with them on managing their reactions to it in the present. Okay, so just because you're on meds doesn't mean you won't react or you won't be affected. It's it's just easier because you're generally in a more uh, you're in a more in a less reactive more you're more in your, your equilibrium okay. but and so but even if you're in you're in your equilibrium you can you know it can still go up and down uh, and that's where uh, talk therapy and the practices that come out of therapy help okay. um, so the two together is something that's quite important and I will I hope that's something that will continue to build uh, in the practice of psychology and psychiatry uh, mm -hmm. in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Yes, Maybe in the future, hard. yeah. Like psychologists can take a course. I, I'm just throwing out ideas <laughs> where, like, you can yeah, study like, like uh, psychi or just for pharm psychopharmacology. Psychopharmacology, yeah. Actually, I do. I do look at that. Um, it's not required, uh, but because of the way I frame um, the cases that I handle, I do always have this very strongly uh, um, biology-based or, you know, I look at, uh, you know, things like, things that we will discuss in module two, like mm. amygdala function, frontal lobe, you know, function, um, or, or, you know, uh, developmentally, like if it's a younger client versus an older client and what that means in terms of their brain um when i when we handle cases like anxiety or, or depression it's my understanding of it is very grounded in um, physiology mm -hmm. the physiology of behavior so because of that and because of um the nature of the cases that I handle, I actually over the years gr have grown to have a better understanding of medication. So now when, when, when I have clients who, who come in and they're on meds, I ask them what meds they're on so that I know. Um, and, uh, or if they're not, if they're gonna consult a psychiatrist, palang, I ask them what meds they're, they're prescribed after. Mm -hmm. I kind of, help them through processing also of adjusting to the meds okay uh like i help them process the side effects and help them report the side effects because is it a side effect or is it just is it something else you know mm -hmm. so a lot of that comes in to the therapy room as well and so over the years because of that i've learned both from my clients and i've of course done my own research and uh, to help myself understand what's happening to my client. So yeah, like once you get there, I don't know, I suppose our psych majors will take this up in fuchsia psych, mm. right? So, so it's very important to know mechanisms of action. Of, uh, we can't avoid it, guys. Yeah. We have to understand. Yeah, and really, if we, if we understand it in that way, then it becomes not just something you study, but something that is very applicable, again, to our understanding of human, of human beings. So, so yeah, that, that makes it interesting to me. It wasn't interesting to me also when I was taking it up in college. It just became more interesting to me when I actually started. Um, Counseling, like the practice and seeing yeah. that there's a need to really understand what yes. your clients are going through. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
So once in a while, I'll, I'll research mechanism of action of this particular drug. So, so, I, so I have a better idea of how it works and how it might affect my client. And I also allow it to inform me as to what uh, um, interventions can uh, work with with the effect of that, the, the, those meds. Mm. So, right. yeah. Okay. So we'll go to the next question, which is, mm -hmm. um, are there even times where two psychologists may have a tendency to have conflicts with one another in treating someone or in connection to what you said, like psychiatrists and psychologists? So, uh -huh. uh, and the example that she gave were, for example, also an industrial psychologist and a developmental psychologist. Okay. All right. So the first thing we have to remember is when it comes to treatment, okay, um, the types of psychologists who work in that way are, are counseling psychologists um, and maybe, yes, also um, counseling psychologists who have a background in developmental uh, psychology. Although developmental psychologists also work with interventions, but when it, when it comes to the one-on-one -on -one counseling and diagnosis, um, it's usually clinical psychologists, counseling okay. psychologists, uh, and psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. uh, industrial psychologists have a very different view. They look at uh, um, behavior of organizations and people within organizations. So it's actually a very different lens. Mm -hmm. um, it's very different from the lens of yeah, a clinical psychologist. So yes. <laughs> the quick answer is yes, there can be um, different opinions. And thing is, different opinions doesn't necessarily mean that one is wrong and the other is right. Okay? Particularly, for example, you have a developmental psychologist saying, ah, it could be that because of what happened in this person during this, these years of development, that this is why this behavior occurs. And then a clinical psychologist will look at something else, maybe, um, yeah, the function of the amygdala okay, and the, uh, or, yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. Or um, that's different from them. Maybe, okay, something that we're actually going to take up in the next few weeks. Like, um, or maybe uh, psychodynamic. Yeah. yeah, they look particularly at the relationship of the person with their parents and their attachments. And this this can be different from what the dev psych person is saying, mm -hmm. but it's not that they they will probably or maybe they'll conflict at first. But if the two points of views are discussed, it can actually make the understanding of this person uh, better. Mm -hmm. and uh, richer and, and you know people are complex so you, we can't just have I think it's helpful to have more than one point of view mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to understanding and treating uh, uh, a person um, so so yes mm -hmm. there can be conflict uh, but this does not necessarily have to work against um the the subject mm -hmm. the person that they are trying to help in fact i find that in many ways making uh, our understanding of people richer and more complex is actually more helpful mm -hmm. however there are also times when for example a am i going to go into this a psychiatrist and a okay, psychologist a, um who is functioning on the medical model and a psychologist and I've had this a lot of this in my experience. Um, usually, the conflict is in that the um, the medical model, okay, the psychiatrist will look at symptoms, okay, because that's what they're trained to do. They look at the symptoms and then they will make a diagnosis based on the symptoms. But then, for example, me as a psychiatrist, as a psychologist, I do look at the symptoms, but I look at what caused the symptoms, because sometimes the symptoms, um, for example. Uh, I've had clients 
who came in with um, symptoms. They reported symptoms of depression. But when I actually spoke to them and dug deeper, I found out and realized that it was the symptoms were, you know, loss of motivation, lethargy, lack of focus. But it wasn't the, the root of all of this was actually trauma. Okay? Mm-hmm. So if the, because I dug a little deeper and I didn't just look at the symptoms, my diagnosis was different. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so yeah, she, yeah. she actually came, the, this client came in with an initial diagnosis and then I had a different diagnosis. So there's a back and forth between me and the client and the psychiatrist the client was uh, consulting. Um, and the, but then, then it all works out. <laughs> Um, if there is good communication between all parties mm-hmm. and yeah, me seeing something from my point of view, the psychiatrist seeing something from a different point of view, and then that discussion will only deepen understanding and that's just, it's always a good thing. Okay. All right. So let's go to the next question, which is, um, are there uh, how do psychological professionals diagnose mentally ill individuals if there are numerous perspectives? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. There are numerous perspectives. And I guess um, this person may have already. Oh, no. Because the numerous perspectives are basically what we touch on in module mm-hmm. one. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Psychodynamic versus like social cognitive or um, behaviorist. Yeah. Um, I like to see the various perspectives as different ways of understanding um, one thing. Like, for example, the diagnosis can be depression or anxiety, right? Say, let's focus on depression. A psychodynamic view of understanding depression is different from a cognitive view of understanding depression. And this this is different from a... um, Let's be more specific. Uh, a develop uh, developmental view, or an, for example, an Ericksonian view of mm-hmm. understanding depression. But all of these things are ways to understand depression. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, having um, from a counseling psychologist's point of view, the multiple ways of understanding depression actually helps me. Uh, Because for my client, for example, not all clients with depression will respond well to a psychodynamic understanding of it. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody who does not respond well to that will say, huh, what do you mean? It's because of my relationship with my mother. What does my relationship with my mother have to do with what I'm feeling now? Mm -hmm. Right. So with a client like that, I will not approach with that psychodynamic understanding of depression. Maybe I'll find a different one. Um, that a different way of explaining the same thing, but can be more easily accepted and understood by my client. Uh, and that's important because if they do not accept and understand, then they, it lessens their ability to help themselves and um, to understand and help themselves. And that's what I want to happen in the therapy room, that they get empowered and then they understand themselves. And when they understand themselves better, it leads to changes in behaviors that help them go back to um, optimal functionality in their lives. Okay? Mm-hmm. So that's what, to me, that's what the various approaches are for. Um, many different ways of understanding one thing. Could be that all of them, all of them are just describing different facets yeah. of it. And so all of the explanations are valid, but you don't need to use all of them during treatment because just one approach can help you already change you know Mm -hmm. uh, how change behavior change in thinking Mm -hmm. and therefore change in a person's life Mm -hmm. and changes in behavior and changes in thinking actually do have a change in physiology Mm -hmm. Uh, there's this kind of feedback uh, Mm -hmm. effect that goes on so to me it's like all of these different approaches are helpful because not everybody speaks the same language. Some people relate to this language more than the other, this approach more than the other. And because they relate to that, that's the key to them understanding themselves and their own behavior. And that's the key to change. 
So seeing the client's response and what they resonate most with and can best adopt into their own yes. Lives. All right. Okay, so the next question is, are there many cases of psychological professionals diagnosed with a mental illness? If so, did this illness come from their experience on their specialization, such as trauma of handling patients, or were they already diagnosed long before they became a professional? Okay, I, I chose this. I don't, as you all know, I don't know who sent in the questions. Actually, of us, I still don't yeah. know until now. Um, but I find that I, I picked this question out because of this common <laughs> saying, I guess, that the people who take psychology are the people who yeah. have problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> or searching As for psych something. majors, we, we get yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, I was a psych major also for my undergrad. So yeah, mm -hmm. I get that a lot. <laughs> and so um, I find that I'll answer this first from that point of view, and then I'll actually talk about people with conditions who still practice. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that the reason why, because, okay, this is my personal opinion. <laughs> I do think that's true. I think people who um, choose something like psychology are likely to be people who have enough self-awareness or develop enough self-awareness to actually look inside and say, ah, oh, this is my problem. Oh, that is my problem. This is my issue. That is my issue. And I don't think that means they have more issues than the general population. I think the tendency for a person who is interested in psychology to find um, issues is because they are looking, because they are looking to understand themselves better. Mm -hmm. And th that's why I don't think that's a bad thing. I yeah. think that's a good thing. Um, so if you look, because <laughs> lots of people have problems, <laughs> uh, you you probably find something. And um, I think I I like I would like to address that now because I think saying that very blatantly is also something that is important in the fight against the stigma that is held about illness. Yeah, when it comes to like mental health issues mm. or, or, or disorders. Um, we want to say that just these things are things that happen to people. And just because they do, it doesn't debilitate you. It doesn't have to debilitate you. So you, we should not be afraid of finding these things in us. Because when we find these things in us, that is the first step to being able to do something about it. To being able to, uh, you know, begin to have, uh, to really learn ways to be productive and fruitful and optimize your performance in life, wherever it is that you go, not just psychology, because we all know that the psychology as a course is also kind of like springboard to anything. Yeah. Uh, so many it's one of those things. Sure, right? possible. Right. So... So <laughs> I guess I, I mean to say, yes, <laughs> usually psychology majors uh, find something, issues, but I think it's because they look for it, because mm -hmm. there is a drive to understand mm -hmm. and then to do something. Mm -hmm. And to me, that doesn't mean we have more problems. It just means we know. And because we know, that means we can do something about it. And I think that's a really healthy place to be. Mm -hmm. So go psych majors yeah. <laughs> okay now to address the second part of that question which is can you practice basically even if you have a diagnosis the short answer is yes of course okay um you really can and um so i'll take that question and i'll just say yes and i'll put it aside for a bit um because i want to focus on the fact that psychologists, uh, counseling psychologists, people in the practice of psychology, they are people. Mm -hmm. They are people who strive to be the healthiest they can be. And I don't think that being a psychologist makes them especially, especially mm -hmm. healthy. No, it's just that they know how, mm -hmm. they know the techniques, yeah. but the applying of that techniques to their own lives, to their own families, to their own friends, is still just them being human beings trying to apply something they learned. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's just that they learned it before their clients learned it. Mm -hmm. 
but they had to learn it themselves. So they are human beings. They don't have superpowers. They're just human beings trying to uh, live the healthiest way they can. It doesn't mean that there are no things that their, their problems are easier to handle or that there are things that uh, there are issues that they doesn't mean that they will always see all their issues. But no, because human beings just are complex like that. So it's actually very highly encouraged among, well, among my peers and my colleagues for psychologists to go to therapy. Right? Because we know, in, because we are very sensitive and highly aware and we're always looking in. Mm -hmm. um, at least we are encouraged to that that is a good thing so that when we find things there we are we are encouraged to go and seek out help and if um in seeking out help a diagnosis comes up of course we are encouraged to you know resolve and get to a stable state before practicing or to pause practice to get into a more stable state so that can happen okay? mm -hmm. But that is just as well. It's it's like how a person who goes to work, who has a mental health issue, and you know their therapist might say, maybe you can try to ease off on some of the stress and try to work on this first before you go back to trying to push yourself to peak performance at work. It's kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah. Mm -hmm. It's common uh, for psychologists to help other psychologists. So it's just like a team of everyone helping each other understand yeah. each other better. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I think the key there is to remember that your psychologists, any psychologist, mm -hmm. me, my fr my friends who are psychologists, we're all, we're, all, we're all just human beings. We're not, we don't have superpowers that help us understand people. Mm -hmm. It's a lens that we're trained in, these are approaches that we're trained in, that we try as much as we can to apply it to our own lives so that we can live mental, we can be mentally healthy. Of course, that doesn't mean that it's perfect. And we do not expect perfection of ourselves as well. So if we do encounter mental health issues in our own lives and we seek out uh, help, mental health help, um, because if we didn't practice what we preached, oh man, then we'd be just a bunch of hypocrites, right? Mm -hmm. So, so yes. Um, and finally, third, okay, because um, I have been, I think the implication of this question uh, is if I already have a diagnosis, does this mean I can't be a psychologist? Okay? And so my quick answer is no, you can. <laughs> You still can, okay? Mm -hmm. Because just because you diagnosis doesn't know oh, I'm doomed for life. No, your diagnosis means you know what it is you, you have to work on to bring yourself to a healthier state. You know what your pitfalls are gonna be. You probably, because you have a diagnosis, have a head start in knowing how to identify your triggers, okay? Mm -hmm. And all of that. If you've gone to therapy yourself, then you know what the process is like. Uh, to me, that's actually a head start in understanding. You've had a head, head start in understanding yourself and knowing the hard work it takes to um, get to a healthier state. Okay. And so that's like uh, learning about the psych psychology and the theories of psychology from the other side. Mm -hmm. right. And now you're learning about it from this side, from the theoretical side and the application side. So isn't that could be great. <laughs> it gives you a, a more depth of understanding when you're going through the healing process yourself. It yeah. helps you. Um, there's a, it also de a develops a passion to want to help other people heal the same way or heal in, a, in their own way, in the yeah. same way that you did. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so there. Um, there's, there. In that way, you, you may have also faced a lot of the stigma mm -hmm. uh, around having a diagnosis so that just gives you a head start in a lot of things that uh need to be understood to practice um in yeah to practice and to do all these things yeah and it, it you also already know the importance of sustaining 
the the application of all these things. Mm -hmm. So if you do it to yourself, as long as you continue doing it to yourself, you can really encourage your clients to do it. <laughs> Actually, even without the diagnosis, like I think psychologists should practice on themselves what they yeah. teach. Yeah. yeah. So, so. So, so a lot of like remembering side concepts is. Uh, I remember you like asking people to relate it to their personal experiences because it always helps them remember the theories more. So, uh, yes, yeah, same case for people who um, undergo therapy themselves or have a have had experience receiving mental uh, help with their issues. All right. So, uh, last few questions. Um, how do we distinguish between the effects of nurture and nature on a human being? Okay. Um, this is actually really tricky. Okay. Because the effects of just nature, uh, even if the nature nurture uh, argument has been around for so long, what we truly know as nature in terms of individuals is actually not that easy to pinpoint because what is truly nature is genetics and biology. So unless everybody gets tested for, uh, unless, you know, for their genome, uh, the patterns in their genome, unless we actually have a way of saying, huh, these, uh, this genetic uh, sequence is what creates this trait, then we actually don't really know what nature is. Um, but we have an idea when we say, when we look, for example, at um, characteristics of behavior between parent and child. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, but then even that, how do you know that's nature? Why won't it, why isn't it nurture? Because a parent, um, being around the parent, modeling a particular kind of behavior and the child learning that behavior, that's nurture, not nature. Um, so my quick answer is it's really hard to determine that. Mm -hmm. uh, however, um, I guess for the people who have who have read their books, the way that this is actually studied is through um, twin studies. Okay? So they they there's a bunch of studies called twin studies, and you can look into them if you want. And what they do is they look at twins who are separated at birth um, and who grew up in two different environments, um, and they what they well the ones i remember reading is they found that there were a surprising um set of similarities between uh the twins and so because those similarities emerged even in the midst of separate um non-shared environments that's what gives people a clue that uh nature really does have an effect Okay, on us um, because and then yeah the differences in the characteristics could be attributed to um, nurture or the environment they grew up in so studies like that show us that yes nature really does have an effect and you can look at those studies to see the variance the r like how much of the characteristics are can be attributed to nature um, but those are like special cases in us in in reality um, what we might look at would be medical records of um, um, our family members to see okay that's those characteristics okay probably nature but then again there's also the maybe it's the culture of the family maybe it's the diet of the family uh, whatever so lots of loopholes and question marks there um, so yes we just know that nature does play an effect but how much yeah. um nurture nurture is maybe easier to catch mm -hmm. but then maybe what's most important to consider anyway is that it's never fully nature it's never fully nurture it's always an interaction between the two mm -hmm. because nature or our genetics just because it's in our genetics doesn't mean it will automatically show okay uh, genotype and and phenotype are two different things mm -hmm. whether or not there will be the phenotype will express depends on uh, the environment mm -hmm. depends on nurture mm -hmm. so 
the current most accepted and I think the most realistic view is nature via nurture. Mm -hmm. All right, so we can't be separated totally. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right, so next question is Is it right to imprison individuals who have accidentally harmed others but had no criminal intent and instead acted out of psychological compulsion, such as OCD or pyromania or etc.? If such a disorder can be treated, is it still effective to imprison? Okay, <laughs> all right. I picked this out knowing it was, this is actually a, a debate that's very interesting but very hard to answer mm -hmm. because what we are asking about here is what is the nature of, um, what do we actually look at when we look at people's behavior? Okay? Because when we look at even non-criminal behavior, for example, just normal behavior, why would a person do this? you know let's just talk about something a little bit more normal not like harming others for example somebody with commitment issues <laughs> why would somebody have commitment issues is, is it because there's something wrong with them is it because they just don't want to commit or could it be because there are certain um, patterns of behavior that they observed around them growing up that made it that taught them a few lessons lessons about attachment and relationships that they carried with them uh, into adulthood uh, or could it be that they went through certain experiences that made them averse to commitment maybe they didn't see that in their parents but they saw it in actual interactions they had with other human beings at certain points in their life. It could be that, it could be both. So when a person has commitment issues, why do they have commitment issues? Is it because they just don't want to commit? Is it because of uh, lessons from their parents? Is it because of past experiences with other partners? Which is it? Or is it all of the above? Yeah. So, right, so it's a thing. When you talk about crime, did this person do this thing, for example, Pyromania, what causes such a problem? Um, so were they, uh, or I don't know about the OCD, but I'm guessing this person probably watches crime, you know, <laughs> crime documentaries. And I think the, um, OCD, I think OCD is uh, implicated. But anyway, the trait that is most associated with uh, expression of OCD is perfectionism, Hi, you know, being overly, they need to be this particular thing. And that's something that's, you know, probably common amongst serial killers mm -hmm. because they need to do this thing in this way, in mm -hmm. the sequence. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if this person is asking about that, but what causes that, okay? One, it could be a function of genetics, okay? Uh, perfectionism or um, you know, fact um, features of OCD have something uh, can be related to how uh, the body um, reacts to cer certain triggers. It's actually related to, it's actually an anxious response because if they don't do it, they feel so uncomfortable. Uh, they have to, their, the compulsions are like that, okay? or the tendency to ruminate. This, these are actually related to certain functioning, for example, of the amygdala. And functioning of the amygdala, uh, which we'll talk more about in module two, mm -hmm. uh, functioning of the amygdala can be related to genetics or can be related to childhood experiences of activation of the amygdala. So childhood experiences of being threatened, for example, when they do not do something perfectly. <laughs> so is it genetics or is it childhood experiences? Or could it be experiences as they were growing up? So developmental experiences. Maybe they were rejected. Maybe they were um, taught to, if it is not perfect, uh, then you'll go to hell, okay? Some, mm -hmm. of, some of it could be religious training right. um, that, that, you know, le led to certain physiological reactions that led to compulsions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or is it 
just that they're evil. (laughs) So which is it? So what really causes people to do harm to others? Is it that they are harmful people or is it that life has taught them these behaviors and that's why? So that's a that's a long philosophical conversation about ethics. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> My quick answer is um, there's also a long conversation about uh, prison mm-hmm. and what this is what is right incarceration and, and rehabilitation. Okay, so those two are those are two different things. Um, so I attempted to answer this question by saying this is a really difficult question to answer because of all these things. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, I guess what we have to remember is that with whatever the explanation is, whatever the why is, at the end of the day, there was a person harmed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's something that needs some regulation. Um, I think... I think we do get into that discussion a little bit, or we can get into that discussion a little bit when it comes to when we talk about morality mm-hmm. in module three. Is it module three or four? Module four or three. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> somewhere, somewhere there. Yeah. yeah. So we'll touch upon it a little bit in module three or four, but we'll touch upon it a lot more when we, when you get to your uh, subject on personality. Okay, because we're we can talk about um we can deepen our discussion of that when we talk about locus of control uh we can deepen our discussion of that when we talk about um maybe the humanistic theories okay Mm -hmm. carl rogers and all of that um but yeah So I attempted to answer this. I picked it up and attempted to answer it just to say it's just way too complicated Mm -hmm. to have a a straightforward answer. Um, But what we have to remember is that people are complicated and hopefully that helps us withhold judgment. Mm -hmm. Um, Because withholding judgment is sometimes really important because we can have a tendency to just see things as black and white and therefore pass judgment. Okay, Like, oh, this is completely evil and that is not. But sometimes things are really more complicated. But that doesn't mean that we excuse everything just because we understand it, Mm -hmm. just because we understand it all. But maybe that will help us not be so harsh. Yeah, Yeah, not be so harsh and so, yeah, not be cruel in our judgments too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So we've now reached our last question, which is kind of um, related. And uh, it is, what is the role of psychology in defining morality? Okay. I think I answered that question yeah. already. Yeah. yeah, psychology helps us really to understand that uh, in understanding behavior, because morality is about the, whether a behavior is good or bad, okay? mm-hmm. ethical or unethical, right or wrong. But when we dive into our understanding of what creates behavior, we're going to encounter the fact that behavior is complex. Mm -hmm. And for any one behavior, there can be many reasons that led to a person uh, behaving that way. And not all of those reasons are under the control of that person. Um, One of my favorite conversations I've ever had in my I guess, in my life, um, was a conversation I had with uh, uh, a priest who was one of my classmates um, mm-hmm. studying to be a psychologist. Uh, I was, we were both taking our MA. And so one time, I think we were working on a project and um, I just, you know, asked him kind of point blank, like, what does he now think about the nature of sin? Because, you know, we're, we were talking about how, yeah, if you look at from the point of view of um, what how behavior occurs uh, and you look at the, the developmental lens, okay? so what builds personality 
and therefore later on behavior has too much to do with how a person grew up. You look at the physiological lens, uh, much of what leads to certain behaviors are all these factors that are physical and unconscious. I mean, we are not, we may not be uh, aware of those things. Um, and then you look at the um, lenses of personality development, uh, the various relationships that we might have had in our lives and the effect of culture, for example, or the effect of poverty, for example, or the effect of spirit, um, yeah, training via big cultural influences like religion. Mm -hmm. All of these things have an effect on a person's behavior. So is any person, how do we now determine which of these behaviors are solely the responsibility of this person and not the responsibility of, for example, how this person was treated by other people that is not under their control. Mm -hmm. And we both agree that that just meant, well, this means that our understanding of people and morality and right or wrong uh, and judging right or wrong has to be, uh, psychology makes it all so much more complicated mm -hmm. than just black and white, right or, not, right or wrong. And so what I hope that um, our students will take away from this is just to not be so quick to judge because, yeah, I, so I think psychology helps us to not be so quick to judge because it's really much more complicated than just this behavior is right or that behavior is wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying there are no right or wrong behaviors. Mm -hmm. It's just our judgment of a person for doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. That is something that can be tempered. Mm -hmm. A lot of critical evaluation of the person and the circumstances and the nature of the action, which is a very complicated discussion. But yeah, just to, I think what you were saying is just to invite everyone to be more critical of um, their judgments of people or be, be more withholding of their judgments of people and see all of the factors that can go into a, an action, a situation or behavior. Okay, so that wraps up our first Q&A for module one, or for our episode one. And uh, I think what will what people will be seeing next is module two after this is uploaded. So I guess, stay tuned for the biological perspective, everyone. And yeah, we'll also be recording our next Q&A podcast. Bye. Yes. And, yeah. Send in your questions, please. Mm -hmm. May they be related to the module start. too? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. All this right. is fun. Let's mm -hmm. do this again. <laughs> okay. This is a good idea. <laughs> All right. Okay. So. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ma.